In this episode, mysteries of origin of the ancient Kazakh customs. Now, almost every person, despite the seemingly modern, high-tech lifestyle, uses something ancient and sacred almost every day. For example, in most countries, it is customary to greet each other by shaking hands. But in fact, this action was inherent in the culture of communication in antiquity and had a much more important meaning. The gesture of a handshake did not allow the person standing opposite to grab a weapon and harm the one who reached out. Or, for example, a fond tradition to drink brotherhood. It has been carried several subtexts at once. The crossing of hands is the admission of a person into his personal space, a symbol of trust. The cup, drunk to the bottom, meant firmness of intentions. While the last background, perhaps the most important, is a kiss on the lips which guaranteed the absence of poison in the drink. Each custom was formed according to the way of people's lives and became part of the mass culture. What traditions were created in the Great Steppe? For example, where traditional Kazakh hospitality comes from. It is one of our outstanding features. Where did this or that custom originate? Each belief was laid out by experience, a thousand-year-old wisdom. It is something very deep. What was the punishment for breaking the tradition? The punishments were different. First of all, it could be a whipping. What ancient traditions have reached our time and remained unchanged? How did the way of life of the ancient Kazakhs influence the formation of this or that custom? Watch all this right now. Initially, the word tradition comes from the Latin language and means to transmit, that is to collect and transmit certain knowledge to future generations. But how did this or that tradition appear? My name is Andrei Slozhin and this is Time Puzzle. And today we will learn about some of the Kazakh traditions and secrets they hold. Starting from ancient times until the formation of the Kazakh Khanate in the 14th-15th centuries, the Kazakhs accumulated a huge amount of folk wisdom, which was transformed into traditions and customs. These original actions were tested for centuries and turned into a certain model of behavior that was passed on from mouth to mouth, from generation to generation, and as a result, joined a huge layer of culture, which undoubtedly influenced not only the life of people in the wider steppe, but also on the history of a whole nation as well as its perception by other nationalities. All researchers are unanimous in this, including the candidate of philological sciences, Kairat Janabayev. Unlike many European and Eastern peoples, nomadic life, it has always lived according to traditions. And those traditions, it is the steppe knowledge itself. The ancient millennial myths, legends, tales, this is all the sacred code of our nation. It originates from those times when the culture of the ancient people who lived on the territory of modern Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and other Asian countries was born. Many of those customs are similar. For example, there is much in common in the national cuisine games, sports and even in lifestyle and housekeeping. Ziyab Kabaldinov, doctor of historical sciences, devoted many years to researching this topic. If we turn our attention to nomadic and semi-nomadic cattle breeding, then its origins go back to 6,000 years ago. This poses the question, why did our ancestors switch to nomadic and semi-nomadic cattle breeding? The fact is our ancestors didn't simply domesticate the horse, it was also the time of the climate change, which was more conductive to engaging in cattle breeding.
One of the main values of the nomad was cattle, and a huge amount of effort was spent on preserving and increasing its population. Special rituals were conducted which, in the opinion of the nomads, would help to protect animals from evil spirits. Long before the arrival of Islam in the region, there was a tradition of purification by fire. It was believed that if a herd, before long-distance traveling, led through an improvised corridor of several fires, then evil spirits would retreat from animals, and the herd would not be threatened with disease and pestilence. The tradition has not been preserved to our days, but it is curious that the ancient cattlemen almost always knew exactly when the ceremony should be carried out more intensely and often. For example, if we look at the ancient Turkic and nomadic Kazakh calendars, we will see that this pattern, it has its sacred meaning. When I son Kaigi comes to Khan Janabek and says, you have given these lands, and in two, three years there will be ice coating in the steps, that is, he knows it all. The people knew that ice coating will be exactly in the year of the white hair. The year of the white hair is not associated with this white hair, but the step is always covered with ice in those years. According to Kairajanabhav, the most fertile period for nomads was the year of the cow. It was then that the livestock had the most offspring. This year it was possible not to worry about the danger of animals. But how did this calendar, according to which the nomads lived, appear? In content, it is very similar to Chinese and it is not surprising. Kazakhstan borders with the Middle Kingdom and there is a lot of evidence in history when the nomads collaborated with their neighbors, mostly of course they traded. However, the researcher is confident that the nomad calendar has its own sacred meaning. The Kazakh fairy tale, how the Eastern calendar appeared, it just shows all these totems, all these animals like hair, snail, wolf, dog. Now it is different, it is in more European way. Or, for example, the year of the mouse. These all were the totems of some tribes and clans. The legend of the Kazakh calendar tells about animals who argued and could not decide which of them is more important for humans. Then the animals came up with the idea that the one who sees the sunrise first will be the main one. The camel was most pleased because it was taller than the others, but the camel overslept. A cunning mouse climbed on the head of a sleeping camel and the first one saw the sun. Since then the mouse is the first in the Kazakh calendar. Kazakhs gave each animal in the calendar its own special meaning. So nomads have always been wary of the year of the rooster or bird. It never entered the category of pets. Besides, if you feed the cattle with grass or hay, which has chicken droppings, the animal will be sick. From this, the belief arose that the year of the rooster or bird would not be very pleasant for the household. And there is another theory why the Kazakh calendar included namely these animals. According to experts and historians, such a set is not accidental. And every myth, every legend, every such superstition, each belief was laid out by experience, a thousand-year-old wisdom. It is something very deep. The Kazakh calendar is not much different from the rest. It also has 24 hours a day, 30 days a month, and 12 months a year. But there is one difference. The 12-year cycle, Mushel. Every 13th year of life is called Mushel Jazz, and this is the time of testing. According to popular beliefs, the Mushal Jas is the transitional period which is accompanied by difficulties, deterioration of health and failures. This period begins at the age of 13, 25, 37, 49, 61 and 73 years. Of course, many people would call it a superstition. However, modern doctors and psychologists confirm the validity of this attitude. So, for example, at age 13, puberty begins. At 25, the production of growth hormone stops, which makes the end of physical youth and development of the organism. At 
At 37, the so-called midlife crisis sets in, and at 49, most people have problems with the function of reproduction. This is the step knowledge, the ancient knowledge that was passed from mouth to mouth. No one wrote, no one published these books. The word of mouth, signs, rites, customs, traditions, myths, legends. This is an epic, epic, the greatest knowledge of our nation. According to Kazakh traditions, during such critical years, you need to be as careful as possible. Do not commit evil deeds, do not take any important decisions, and try to spend a year in a quiet life. After the fateful year, a feast was held. All relatives and neighbors should be invited to it. The more people come, the better. If the Kazakhs are settled at the equator, then one can bypass the globe without a single penny. These are famous Russian writers, researchers, who personally saw the existence of this tradition in all its glory. In general, the Kazakhs considered the guest sacred. A guest was seated at the best place in the yurt, and always had the most delicious dishes in front of him or her on the table. The guest was given gifts, and people tried to please guests in every possible way. Kazakh hospitality is now one of the main trends of Kazakhstan and its hallmark. It's curious that this ancient tradition is not just a trait of character. It is directly related to nomadic cattle breeding. Our ancestors were forced to constantly split up into small tribal groups. Not because of the fact that people could not find a common language, but because the presence of a large number of livestock suggests budding from each other over considerable distances. Otherwise, there was a process of quickly trampling pastures and then there would be a need to roam almost every day. Disassemble, assemble yurts. Therefore, the Kazakhs migrated from each other over fairly long distances, which often exceeded 500 kilometers. Even siblings could live so far apart. Most of the villages at that time were divided into small sites of 20 to 50 people, as a rule, one or two families. The first researchers who studied the nomads' life also wrote a lot about it. And due to the breeding of livestock, almost every stepman was rich and wealthy. A significant part of Russian researchers of the 18th century, the same Miller, Falk, or Bartonez, who participated in expeditions in the territory of modern Kazakhstan, noted one common quality, that the steppe people lived in small settlements far from each other while they were very rich and wealthy. Accordingly, they never had a shortage of food. Meat, milk, and various semi-finished products made from the same ingredients were stored in abundance. Moreover, according to the researchers, such semi-finished products not only made it possible to preserve food suitable for human consumption for a long period, but were also a kind of dry ration in military campaigns for soldiers. Therefore, such food has always been reserved in case of a general military collection. Also, part of these reserves must be kept in case a guest suddenly arrives. <laughs> Moreover, in our legends and myths, there is such an opinion that one part of the livestock is the share of the guest, and the guest is always considered the messenger of the Almighty. He cannot be insulted and cannot be offended. Even in the yurt, the owner sits with his back to the door of the yurt, and the guest sits in a place called Dor. This is a place of honor. And suddenly a man appears, let's say a representative of another kind, another Jews, or another race, and a Kazakh man welcomes him with open arms, because people who live in isolation, for some time they seem to have a state of waiting. That state of waiting generates a state of hospitality. They are glad to any person, the carrier of some fresh information. They accept him, give him a place to stay. Then he rests, whined, and dined. 
And the responsibility of the owner was not only to shelter and feed the guest, but also to ensure his or her safety. All this regardless of nationality, religion, and guest's welfare. For example, Russian researchers of the 19th century. For example, Dahl, who investigated Kazakhstan, says that if you were in Kazakhstan, then forget your wallet, because here you will be met and fed and even more given some gifts. Thus, one of the main traditions of the Kazakh people, hospitality, was formed due to the fact that this was one of the ways of communication in the vast steppes. But was it the only way for nomads to exchange information? Of course not. Coming up next, how did the Kazakhs transfer knowledge without using letters and words? This is an eternal transfer. It is not as simple as in the European tradition. This is an overflow of processes. When we speak about the Kazakh language, any Turkic language is an internal transmission since the Sumerian era 5,000 years ago. This includes rock paintings, patterns and clothing, weapons or dishes. The jewelers also imported a great deal in their work. For example, with the help of jewelry, it was possible to understand whether a man has adult children who are married. There was a special ring that the mother of the newlyweds wore on two fingers at once. As for clothes, it seems to me that all the best traditions are gathered there, because whatever thing we take, it is always very beautifully decorated with an ornament. Speaking about the ornament, first of all, it, it is necessary to say that whenever this ornament is depicted on clothes or on jewelry or in some household item, this is primarily a protective charm. Another version says that the ornaments are nothing more than the encrypted wisdom, which over time transformed into certain patterns that began to be applied to weapons, carpets, or jewelry. These ornaments are not ornaments by themselves. Germans said that ornaments are the message of the ancients. A person who uses them did not invent them. They came to him from his grandfather and to him from his grandfather and so on. There are many traditions in which jewelry is used. For example, when a child was bathed, then all silver items were dropped into a vat of water. It is not known for certain whether the nomads knew about the miraculous effects of silver and water, but this tradition has survived to our days. And the usefulness of this type of bathing in silver water was also confirmed by modern scientists. The same applies to women's dresses. Married women wore modest dresses of inconspicuous flowers. Marriageable girls, on the contrary, dressed up in beautiful bride dresses, by the way, which they sewed themselves. Thus, they emphasized their beauty and skills of the needlewoman. Women had to close their chest, arms, fully long sleeves in any clothing, and a hat. Either it was just a shawl or a takia or a skull cap. There were also many different forms of women's hats. But the main thing is it was necessary to cover the head. A Kazakh woman never covered her face. It was considered that an uncovered head attracts perhaps some negative energy. In the context of the modern explanation, such a tradition to close bare parts of the body is also explained quite simply. The climatic features of the region where the nomads lived, the hot sun left burns on the skin. Permanently being in an open space without a headdress could inevitably lead to sunstroke. Also, clothes protected from insects, dust and sand, which periodically filled the steppe air. A woman's dress is always a long dress, almost to the ankle, and surely, of course, the trousers, which made of cotton, very spacious, so that it is convenient to move because the Kazakh woman was constantly working and in motion. And even those underwear was decorated with ornaments. 
And this, too, was not just for appearance. As you know, according to the nomad patterns, had magical properties of charms which were meant to keep its owner from diseases and evil spirits. The tradition of decorating clothes with ornaments had a sacred meaning. What matters is that the person knew about the power of thought. People believed in power of charms and believed that the power remains in certain items and those items will continue to serve the person who will wear them. And people handed them down to their children, grandchildren and so on. Now would call it energy component, but in fact people knew it a long ago. They used it, they lived with it. As a rule, the ability to own any craft transmitted from parents to children. In the process of learning, parents also told the history of the family about the exploits of their ancestors and shared their wisdom and experience. This leads us to another ancient tradition. In the conditions of a nomadic pastoral life, it was very difficult to written culture to blossom in its full glory. Therefore, people needed transmitters of information, rituals, customs, traditions, all that centuries-old experience. And this function was fulfilled by older people. It was the old men who kept the most important sacred knowledge that could not be found in books and scrolls. It was the old men who kept and passed on the experience of their ancestors to the younger generation. Of course, the attitude towards older people was tremulous and, and sacred, and this hierarchy was built on all levels of life. For example, if there were young people in front of the exit hall, they were not allowed to start a conversation or a meal. There was even a saying in the people about this, beware of a son who speaks ahead of his father and beware of a daughter acting ahead of her mother. Since ancient times, Kazakhs say that if the elder person is in the house, then consider that happiness has settled in the house. In all customs, rites, proverbs, sayings, there is a clear respect for the older generation. Such a respectful attitude towards older people eventually transformed into another tradition, which is still observed in many Kazakh families. However, modern researchers of traditional Kazakh culture can't say exactly how it appeared. Given good wishes, Bata is a unique tradition. We as historians, ethnologists, suggest that it was born before the advent of Islam. Generally, it has nothing to do with Islam. According to sources, the tradition to give Bata existed in pre-Islamic time, so it existed even before the 7th or 8th century. Bata is a kind of farewell, goodwill which gives the elder of the family, or a rare honored and a dear guest. People asked for Bata before the start of important accomplishments, travels and other significant events. Many researchers believe that the initially Bata was the instructions of the rulers or the bees to their people during the holidays, as they would say now, the message of the president. Gradually, Bata transformed from ordinary words into poetic form. Bata, Bata, which took a verbal poetic form, was passed on from generation to generation, from century to century, from millennium to millennium. For example, in the 19th century, there lived a famous bee. His name was Bidali Bi. That Bidali Bi, being a guest in a hospitable house, he gave Bata, which consists of seven lines, and that's how he expressed it. The first, Densaulik, which is health. The second is freedom. The third is mind and power. The fourth is the wealth of language or oratory. Fifth, children. The sixth is a good wife if it is addressed to a young man. 
and the seventh is wealth in the form of hundred sheep. And the person who listens attentively knows that it is addressed to him. He tries to stick to it. Among the nomads, the authority of the elder was unshakable. Following traditions was so important that they were treated like a law. But sometimes there were people who neglected it. And then they, like the lawbreakers, were punished. Punishments were different. First of all, it could be a whipping. There could be a punishment like eviction from the limits of a clan, a tribe, and a Jews on its outskirts. A person who violated the tradition of respect for elders was evicted outside the country or residence, and he'd become the property of the first raider. He was out of generic protection, therefore this was the most terrible punishment. Moreover, they put him on a cow, facing the tail of the animal, smeared his face with soot, put felt on his head and drove him all over the village. It was one of the worst offensive punishments for ambitious steppe dwellers who had never seen slavery, never had served them. It beat the ambitions of the steppe people, so everyone was afraid of these punishments. Coming up next, how to build a house for free and live up to a hundred years. In the steppes, it was not rare that any person could lose almost all the cattle because of a disease or lose a yurt with all the acquired good on fire or some other misfortune occurred, after which the person could lose almost everything. Thanks to another good and ancient tradition, a, a hapless person was not left alone with his grief. <laughs> In the steppe, there was always customs of mutual aid and mutual support. For example, a Tsar custom. A Tsar was used in the construction of winter dwellings, schools, mosques. The whole owl, the whole family gathered, worked free of charge at the invitation of the individual householder. And at the same time, none of the people demand any payment. He worked for free. And every steppe man, a representative of the clan of the owl, had such a right to convene people, according to a Tsar custom. Instead, it was only necessary to feed those who came to the rescue. In the future, this tradition has expanded and transformed. For example, the richer inhabitants of the village were to distribute part of their herd to the poor. But it was not just a gift, as if they were saying it was a contingency insurance. In the steppes since ancient times, there was a custom when rich people, rich relatives, distributed cattle to their less wealthy relatives. And when a rich kinsman suddenly lost livestock, his environment has always helped to restore the horse livestock. This tradition was from time immemorial. In general, most of the Kazakh traditions and customs are similar to some kind of mutual aid fund. For example, if a person lost livestock, he could go to anyone in the village and take his horse to find his property. It was impossible to refuse. There was a custom to start a fire in the steppes so that the next grass would grow very juicy, high quality. Therefore, sometimes steppe inhabitants lost their yurts during a fire. Together with the yurt and the fire, they lost all property, household belongings, household items, and so on. At this time, the inhabitants of the village, of the family, of the tribe, always helped to restore that person's household belongings, yurt, clothes, shoes, and so on. There are similar rules of mutual assistance among the peoples of the Caucasus. So, for example, collective assistance in carrying out agricultural work or building a house is called mill, and it is still practiced in Dagestan.
Speaking about the Caucasus, we always remember the longevity with which this region is rich. Do you know what was the life expectancy of the steppe people here in Kazakhstan? I'm sure the answer to this question will surprise you. People aged 70, 80, 90, and even 100 years could marry and they could have children. Therefore, there are still settlements. And in Shezhere, on the genealogical table, some of the modern Kazakhs have ancestors who have the names like Yalubai, Alpizbai, Jetpizbai, Seksenbai, Toksenbai, Juzbai. If a person's name is Juzbai, then he was born when his father was older than 90 or was almost 100 years old. In 1924, there was such an Alash leader, Kushki Kemengirov. He wrote a book called The History of the Kazakhs, in which he also says that until the 19th century, the steppe people lived for a very long time. There were a lot of century-olds and more. At the same time, they did not lose their hearing, did not lose their vision, and even rode horses. And he says when 70-year-old people die, then 9100 years old Aksakals being on horseback wept with the pronunciation of the word Baurim, little brother. Of course, it is difficult to call longevity a national tradition. However, according to scientists, it, it was tradition that led to the fact that among the nomads there was such a huge number of people whose age often reached 100 years. Such features amazed visiting researchers. Our ancestors lived 90 to 100 years or more. The absolute majority of researchers of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, write about one unique fact that steppe people live for a very long time. That in the steppe there was a tradition of longevity and the steppe people were physically very strong. German scientist Schwartz says that in the steppe among Europeans, among researchers, there was such a saying, healthy like a Kyrgyz or healthy like a Kazakh because special climatic conditions, sharply continental climate, constant presence in the air, constant movement from one place to another, migrations, use of kumis, natural food, the absence of stressful situations when all conflict situations, offenses were resolved by Adat or a step B court, then people lived for a very long time at that time. During the long life in the family, many children were born, and this is also a tradition. It is interesting that the elder sons were more free to choose brides, but there were more exacting requirements for the spouse of the younger son. Anyway, the younger child was treated specially. The youngest was given priority to support parents, first of all, probably because the parents, when given an inheritance to their elder sons, they probably had the strength, the ability to independently run their extensive farm to contain several thousand horses alone. In the countryside and in the city, this tradition is still alive when the youngest son knows from childhood that his parents remain with him, and parents know about it. Therefore, they choose the bride more carefully, because she is not only for their son, but for them also. Thus, the parents were confident in their calm old age. However, there have been cases in which children were left orphans in the course of hostilities or any tragedy. It would seem that they are doomed to starvation. In fact, this case was also thought out in a nomadic society. <laughs> There were practically no orphans, it was unthinkable of. In the case of the loss of the breadwinner, naturally all his children become the responsibility of the younger brother, becoming full members of the family. Therefore, a talented child who was noticed immediately, who had some abilities, could not get lost in this life.
After the completion of a period of active manual labor, the old people were assigned a new function, a much more important one. Traditionally, it was the education of grandchildren. Grandfathers and grandmothers were universal teachers who, in a playful and comic form, told their grandchildren stories, taught them to navigate the stars, to understand plants, animals, and even the rules of etiquette. Actually, teaching of economic activities and the teachers were firstly, of course, grandfathers, Ata, grandfathers, Aksakals, experienced ones. It is the grandfathers who let and showed the children everything. Name each blade of grass, what it is called, what is the name of this and that insect, and how this or that animal is called, the knowledge of the world. This is how it all happened in the traditional culture, in the traditional way. Having received, as it were, primary education from grandparents, then the child was already trained by his father, depending on his specialization. If the father was a jeweler, his son was trained to work with the precious metals. If the father was a potter or a grass blower, then the child took on this knowledge. Of course, fathers were involved mastering learning craft, teaching animal husbandry, right up to veterinary knowledge, how to treat livestock and so on. Of course, a jeweler to a jeweler, a gunsmith to a gunsmith, a hunter to a hunter, butter to butter, hon to hon. It is very important. Everyone transmits what he knows. In one of the poems, Shalki says this, From far distant lakes, swan shoals fly. He says to Khan, Do not shoot. Cool your first impulse. Take one of the best arrows out. You know that many luxurious arrows have been prepared for the son of the most worthy fathers. It is not about arrows, but about experience, methods, systems. That is, you are a father's son, and you should know this story. What happened in such situations? Many luxurious arrows are prepared. Many Many words hitting deeper than arrows, that is, some words and some actions. They can immediately break the situation deeper than arrows. Keep silent at the first evil call. Think about the consequences with open heart. So what he was teaching his son, not just come, but to his knowledge, because this knowledge of the ancestors was transmitted from father to son. There were many situations. This was done in the form of images, an arrow. That is, do not shoot the swans, and these are your brothers flying, because they are somewhere from far distant lake something happened and you need to figure out what's wrong according to national customs every boy regardless of who his father was was trained in horse riding archery and weapon possession also compulsory subjects of study were music and poetry in the old days it was hardly possible to find someone among the Kazakhs who could not play the Dombra and make verses from a young age, little children, they listened to Aites of Akins, listened to speeches by Jirao Khans. They could tell it all by heart. It is mnemonics. It did not seem didactics, preaching boring. No, it was interesting because it was instead of the theater. I met one Aksakal who said that even in the 30s, 40s, every young man composed poems, played the Dombra and so on. If there was such an eccentric who did not sing, who did not write poems, who did not play Dombra or Kobes, then he was shamed. They said everyone is singing, everybody composes, everybody plays musical instruments, Dombra, why can't you do it? Woven from strong threads of centuries-old wisdom, traditions and rituals were so strongly included in the daily life of nomads that they could not be affected by any external influences. But it trade relations and contacts with other civilizations, new religions and rulers. On the contrary, these rules of life were carefully preserved and passed on to future generations, as well as hundreds of thousands of years ago. And modern grandparents continue to quietly and kindly transfer knowledge about the most important and sacred things to their children and grandchildren. 
Of course, this is only a small part of the traditions that we were able to cover. In Kazakh culture, there are still a huge number of customs, wedding, attribute to children, to housing, even funerals. There are those traditions which have gone into oblivion. I will definitely tell about them later. My name is Andrei Slozhin, and it was the Time Puzzle. See ya!